to the Kent Lap Podcast. And I think we would both agree that we love Jesus, right? I just think we would interpret his life somewhat differently mm. um, and the whole point of his life differently. Whereas I think, ma- you know, mainstream Christianity would say that Jesus was born to die. Mm. The whole reason Jesus shows up is so Jesus can die it, and then, you know, pay the price for human sin and be raised from the dead. I, I just, I don't begin there. I don't think okay. that that's how it works. Okay. Um, I, th- I think that one of the, for me, penal substitutionary atonement has done so much damage to the gospel mm. because it creates, uh, first and foremost, a, a God who has to be bought off, a God who can't just love me and forgive me. I, I, and I always I just struggled with the fact that Jesus would say, no, love your enemies and forgive people. Mm. Um, because that's what God is like. And then God's like, well, ish. Mm. <laughs> but if you don't do this and believe this and say this, then you're going to be in big trouble. Mm-hmm. Or if, if I don't kill my son, I can't love you in the same way. And I just found that long time, long term problematic. Mm. And so I think if we begin with a God who has to be convinced to forgive us and love us, then we have a really, really sort of toxic um, mm-hmm. place that we're beginning from. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it also creates in us an understanding of what it means to be human that works against human flourishing. And what I mean is I'll never forget a few years ago being at a youth camp um, with our church group. And there was, it was one of those things we, it was, when you, when you sort of move into a more progressive faith space, you, you lose everything. Like you can't, like even taking your kids to church camp becomes sort of like, what what are what are they going to hear that is is almost like uh, exactly the opposite of what we've been saying, mm. right? And so, how do we help them navigate what they think about that? Sure. But there, the camp pastor that week was like, "I'm not going to try to scare your kids. I'm not going to threaten them. I'm just going to share what I believe to be the good news." Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, that's. And then the, that night, like he starts threatening them and scaring them. <laughs> uh, this was not a progressive camp. No, you're no, saying no. okay, no. Okay. Um, and so. The point of the story is there was a kid from another church group who was sitting by himself up front crying, and one of our volunteers went over to him, and um, the kid was just saying, I'm terrible. I'm horrible. I don't deserve anything good. Mm -hmm. I'm a terrible human being. And the the volunteer with us said, how old are you? And he said, I'm 11. He's like, you're you're 11. You're you're not terrible. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You're not horrible. You're a human being that God loves dearly. And I think that we, from a very early age, when we're telling our kids that to be human is somehow to be less than good, mm. when I think the reality is that to be human is exactly who we're supposed to be. And, and to use human as a way of sort of saying, well, I mean, we use it all the time, right? Well, I'm only human. It, this is why I screwed up. Mm-hmm. And I think the problem is, we, it's not because we're human. I think the problem is we often choose to live in ways that are subhuman, mm. that are beneath the humanity that God called good. Um, and so for me, part of being a progressive Christian means, yes, we're, go- we're not going to talk about God in the same way in, in terms of atonement, but we're also not going to talk about human beings in the same way. We want okay. to recognize the original goodness in humanity and, and understand that, yeah, we've got a lot of work to do, mm-hmm. um, and we've made a lot of mistakes and errors since, whatever you want to call it, but the core of what God affirmed as good is good. Mm-hmm. And our mission should be to um, promote human flourishing. Mm-hmm. And I, I think when we do that, we're actually living into and out of the gospel because I think that's what the gospel is about. Yeah. Human flourishing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure that I would even disagree on the, on the human flourishing point. You know, I mean, it's, um, we have the kingdom of God is present now, right? It's not like we have to kind of just suffer along and hope he just comes back to save everything. Like that, that, um, the kingdom of God is present now. But what do you do with, uh, did you mention kind of going back to the original kind of goodness of human beings? And I forget, it's not quite what you said, but um, but where would you go back to? Like, would you believe in an actual Adam and Eve or no? Because I was just going to say like Cain and Abel, they weren't the best. Like, you know, right. we had some we had some problems kind of almost right out of the gate. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't I don't take those stories literally. Oh, okay. Um, I don't. But for me, the truth of those stories I would affirm the truth of those stories. I see. I, I don't need them to be literally true to be speaking an important truth. Okay. So, um, but here's what's really interesting. The, the sort of the way, at least I was, you know, as an evangelical was brought into the, to understand the story is that um, in the Bible, Genesis 3, human beings disobey God. They mm-hmm. commit the first sin as an act of rebellion. 
and everything falls apart. Mm -hmm. Here's what's really interesting. The word sin does not show up in the Bible until Genesis 4. Hmm. In Genesis 3, at no point, at no point, is the word sin used. Mm -hmm. Um, And what's really maybe even more fascinating is sort of the way we've been taught to read the fall narrative is human beings sinned, and then God can't be around them anymore, mm. right? Like God is holy and pure, so God can't be. That's not what happens in the story. Mm-hmm. They, they sin, and they go into hiding, and God shows up in the garden for the walk. Mm-hmm. It, it, they don't repel God. The, their shame leads them into hiding. Yep. And it's almost like the problem in Genesis 3 is, is that human beings, uh, we allow shame to cause us to pull away from the very thing that can yes. be healing for us. Right. And sin actually enters the story in Genesis 4 um, with the Cain and Abel story. Mm-hmm. And it's when Cain is angry uh, because his brother's offering was accepted in his way. And, you know, I, I just think, like, at some point I wish they'd have said, I'm an English major in college. So com- coming to that writing piece where, like, we don't know why Cain, in the story, we're giving no indication of why Cain's offering wasn't accepted in life. Right, It's yes. just a weird sort yep. of... Um, but. That's when, when, when God says to Cain, sin is, and it's sort of the image of a cat ready to pounce. Like mm-hmm. sin is crouched by the door ready to pounce on you, mm-hmm. but you must rule over it. And then he goes out and he says to his brother Abel, let's go out into the field. And if you're watching this like a, like a horror movie, you're screaming at the TV, do not go out into the field. Right. Um, and of course, that's where he ends up killing his brother. And so for me, what, where I sort of land on that is I think that the original human sin, if you want to call it that, is violence, mm-hmm. because that's where sin shows up in the Bible, and it shows up as being this first act of violence. And it's not sins plural, it's sin singular. Um, and, and it enters the story, and very quickly, this is not what you brought me in to talk about, but here we are. Um, yeah. Very quickly, you go from Cain killing Abel to a descendant of Cain, essentially saying, I killed somebody for wounding me, mm-hmm. for hurting me. If Cain is avenged seven times, Lamech, which is this descendant, is avenged 77 times, mm. which is also a wink and a nudge to that in a Jesus story. When mm-hmm. He's like, how many, Peter's like, how many times do I forgive? Up to 77 times. Mm-hmm. It's a reference back to that story. And Jesus yep. is like, nope. <laughs> Essentially limitless. Yes. Because yep. we're trying to undo a, a, the story of human violence. Yep. Yep. So would you, let's just kind of, if, kind of going back to, I mean, kind of thinking like the beginning of time, um, would you believe in an in infinite God? What do you mean? Uh, like a creator God that always has been and always will? I, so I, I, I don't believe in a being that's separate and distinct. Okay. It, from? From like that there's creation here. Okay. And there's a being called God that's somewhere back here. Oh, okay. I would, I would lean more toward panentheism. Okay. Which is everything exists in God. Okay. So that God is not a distant, separate, detached reality. Yep. That if we're fish, God's the water. Mm-hmm. And that our experience, so the experience many of us talk about, which is a spirit, an experience of estrangement, mm-hmm. but estrangement isn't separation. Yep. Estrangement is the sense, the feeling. It, you know, it's an internal yeah. journey that has to be made. Sure. And so I don't think that there's a moment in our lives where we exist outside of God. 